we started the semester talking about algebraic structure as a sort of a general idea, right? As a way of taking a set of objects and imbuing them with some kind of operation. If it's a binary operation, then we get something called a magma, right? That can take two objects and produce a third object in that set for me. Um, and that the properties that attach to that binary operation define an algebraic structure. Uh, and different kinds of algebraic structures have different uses. Uh, and so our goal here to finish the semester is to build an algebraic structure that can, as much as possible, capture the knottiness of a knot, right? Um, so here's where we're going to start. And we want the structure to be a knot invariant, and that's going to be why we, why we care about this process. So we'll start by thinking about what the most general picture uh, that we could draw for this would look like. So what I want is a magma, first of all. So I'm going to have a set of elements and a binary operation on that set. And I want the elements in that magma to be the, the arcs of a knot diagram, right? So the elements are going to be the arcs in my algebraic structure. And then I want an operation. And that binary operation is going to tell me, given the, the two arcs that are incident at a crossing, it's going to tell me something about that third arc, right? So the picture looks something like this. Uh, if I have two arcs, X and Y, that are coming together at a crossing, and Y is my bridge arc, um, then the name of the next arc, the other highway arc, if you like, is going to be X triangle Y, where triangle is my binary operation for this magnet. Uh, so this is the idea. And again, we're going to be careful right now to kind of distinguish my overcrossing arc Y from the two undercrossing arcs X and then X triangle Y. So the question is, how can I, what properties should this triangle operation have so as to give me something which is not a diagram property, but which is actually a knot invariant. Right? I need to figure out how, like, what kinds of triangle operations would qualify so that we would get a knot invariant out of the structure that we're building. Right? Remember from our last section that the way to test whether or not a diagram property is a knot invariant is to test to see that that property remains the same under any of the three Reitermeister moves that we can use to change one diagram of a knot into a different diagram of that same knot. Remember those Reitermeister moves came in these three flavors, the twisting and untwisting that we call the type one move, the poking and unpoking that we call the type two move that kind of creates and destroys two crossings at the same time, and then the sliding operation that we call the, the slide move, the type three move, uh, that just moves one strand uh, that's sitting either all the way above or all the way below a crossing from one side of that crossing to the other side of that crossing. So the next set of three activities um, that I want to give us a good 15 or so minutes to talk about in your team um, is what must be true about this triangle operation, right? That sort of gives me a name to the other highway arc, X triangle Y, where the bridge arc Y meets the highway arc X. What must be true as a result of insisting upon type one Reitermeister invariance for my diagram? So the way to figure this out is to take this diagram, which is a very simple knot diagram, right? It's just a single arc and its name is X. Apply a type one Reitermeister move to this diagram. It's going to create a crossing. And then your job is to name the three arcs at that crossing according to this triangling property. So sketch this little diagram here just to remind yourself, sketch it somewhere uh, about how this triangle thing works. And when you create that crossing using a type one Reitermeister move, it's gonna give you a different expression for the, the X and triangle must satisfy. So see if you can figure out what that type one Reitermeister move is gonna tell you about the triangle operation, what property the triangle operation has. Um, and the hint that I'll give you is that the property that the triangle operation must have is gonna be one of the algebraic properties that we talked about in the first week of class. So we had this big laundry list of different types of algebraic properties. There are many others, but this is just you know a big list of the ones that we talked about. Um, it's gonna be one of those properties that actually has a name. So take a look at that one. Um, same thing for a type two Reitermeister move. So we take a very simple diagram that just has two arcs that don't cross one another and we call them X and Y. Now apply a type two poking Reitermeister move to this. It's gonna create two crossings. And with those two crossings, see if you can tell me what the triangle operation must satisfy. And for the type three move, because it's sort of complicated, I'm gonna show you both sides um, of it. So here is a diagram of 
uh, a you know three crossings both before and after a type three Reitermeister move. So what's been done here is that this Z arc, which lies above both of these X and Y strands, has been moved from sort of the right side of this crossing over onto the left side of that crossing instead. Um, and if you just sort of look at the colors at the ends of these rainbows, um, the this arc is still Z after all. This arc is Y triangle Z. And this arc is the quantity X triangle Y triangled with Z. And why is that? That's because it's the result of what happens after we move past this crossing where one of the highway arcs is X triangle Y, the other highway arc, the bridge arc is Z. And therefore this third arc is the quantity X triangle Y triangled with Z. But then if I look at the same diagram after the type three Reitermeister move has been applied, the name of this colored arc here on this side, which is the same arc as we would have had over here, but the name is now different. We have a different expression for the color of the same arc after we've done the type 3 Reitermeister move. And so those two expressions must be equal if we're going to have a knot invariant, right? Whatever color gets assigned to this arc, for example, by my triangle operation before the type 3 Reitermeister move has to be the same as the color we would have assigned to that arc after the type 3 Reitermeister move. So this expression and that expression have to agree with one another. Um, so your job is to figure out what that means for the type one and the type two Reitermeister move as well. And that's going to give us a list of three properties that this triangle operation must satisfy in order to give me an algebraic structure, give rise to a magma that is itself a knot invariant. So you found out that the three Reitermeister moves in order that they, in order that this triangle operation define an algebraic structure, which is a knot invariant. In other words, in order for it to be invariant under each of the three uh, Reitermeister moves, um, we have to have in turn um, that after a type one Reitermeister move is done to this diagram, we find out that X triangle X has to be the same as X. In other words, this triangle operation has to have the item potent property. Um, the Reitermeister type three move shows us that we have to have the what's called right distributive property, that the quantity X triangle Y triangle with Z has to be the same as the quantity X triangle with Z, triangle with the quantity Y triangle Z. Um, interestingly, it's an interesting thing to check and see if left distributivity is necessary for one of these structures. I, I think it's not. Um, you can come up with an example of, a, of a, uh, a couple of inequivalent diagrams that would be, that would sort of show that those two are not the same. Um, and then the third property that comes from the type two Reitermeister move um, says that X triangle Y quantity, triangle Y, gives us X back. So it's a bit like saying, if I triangle with something twice in a row, it just gets me back to what my original color was. Right? If I triangle with Y and then I triangle with Y once again. It's a bit like saying, um, if I go underneath the Y bridge and then I keep going such that Y now goes, oh, uh, such that I pass under, Y passes, no, Y passes under me. Right, so I go under the Y bridge, but then I keep driving and Y passes under me. <laughs> then I haven't done anything at all, right? X triangle, Y triangle, Y gives me x back. So those three properties define an algebraic structure called a K, K-E-I. Um, this is a word invented by a Japanese mathematician named Takasaki. Uh, so I think it's pronounced K um, in Japanese language. And so it has these three properties, the item component property, the right distributive property, and x triangle y triangle y is equal to x. So this is nothing more than just a, you know, a specific kind of algebraic structure, a specific kind of magma. And so if I hand you, for example, uh, an operation table for a magma, you should be able to check and see whether these properties are satisfied. So for example, we can tell from this operation table that the item potent property is satisfied because A triangle A is equal to A. And the same thing is true for B. B triangle B is B. C triangle C is C, right? So for the three elements in this magma, they all satisfy the item potent property. Um, it's a little bit more tedious to then show that it satisfies the other two properties, um, only because we have to check, let's see, it would be three choose two, which is, uh, well, we'd have to check all pairs. No, actually, yeah, it would have to be three times three. We'd have to check nine different pairs of elements to check the property number two, and we'd have to check 27 different triplets of elements in order to verify that property three holds. So we won't subject ourselves to that. Um, we'll, we'll just say that this operation table does in fact describe a, a K. This magma is a K. Um, but what's interesting is that Ks in general are not, they don't have other of the sort of nice algebraic properties we like to take for granted in undergraduate abstract algebra. This doesn't form a group. 
for example, there is no identity element in here, right? Um, there's no element that doesn't change the stuff that it operates on. So we definitely don't have a group. We don't have identity property. We don't have associativity generally in a K, um, which is another issue if we want to do undergraduate level sort of abstract algebra with it. Um, and because we don't have an identity, we also don't really have inverses. Um, so it kind of, it has none of those really nice properties. It just has these three things which are sort of custom built to be able to be not invariants because they have Reitermeister equivalents. One of the nice things though, is that we can find some concrete examples of algebraic structures that mimic the operations of a K. Um, one of them is this X triangle Y equals two Y minus X operation. This ties directly back into our um, averaging that we were doing with colorations from before, right? Um, because if Y is my bridge arc in my diagram and X and X triangle Y are my two uh, highway arcs, then this is nothing more than saying that my second highway arc uh, and my other highway arc average together to give me the bridge arc, right? So this is just a reframing of the averaging equation, which defined for us the, the coloration criteria from before. And we can show that this operation does actually make the integers into a K. They also make the integers mod K into a K, right? So if we're trying to test whether or not there exists three colorations or four colorations or whatever, what we're really kind of doing is searching for whether or not our knot diagram um, can support a three element K or four element K uh, into it. Using this operation gives us an algebraic way to do that test. Um, you did a part of this problem in the very first homework assignment and your very first uh, portfolio problems has part of the verification uh, that this operation is a K operation. Um, but there are others as well, right? Um, if we choose a different kind of averaging where instead of going halfway in between, we go T percent of the way from, from one of the elements to the other, um, then we get you know a, a different operation called the uh, Alexander K, uh, one minus T quantity times X plus T times Y. Um, and that structure gets us down the road toward the Alexander polynomial. Uh, we can also define an operation in a group which is called conjugation. To conjugate X by Y is to form the group element Y times X times Y inverse. Um, that operation in a group also satisfies this K property. Uh, and so what that means is that we'd be able to have a group structure that mimics the structure of a K as well. That's the path we're not going to go down today that leads us toward the group of a knot, um, which assigns an actual group to the structure that a knot forms. So what we are going to do to wrap up um, is we're going to construct the one K to rule them all for a knot, right? We've been talking about different ways that different kinds of specific Ks we can attach to a knot can tell us something about the knot. But we want to get the, the, this is the Rosetta Stone, the one K that tells us as much information as possible about a knot diagram. 